palavras, porque não se trata aqui de consumir muito tempo, só um pouco do contexto desse encontro, que foi pensado e agora está sendo uh, realizado por uma colaboração uh, nossa, Instituto Fernando Henrique Cardoso, com o Centro Empresarial Brasil-China. Hoje aqui, ambas as instituições representadas pelos seus diretores executivos, chegou, chegou o presidente. Uh, Sérgio Amaral uh, está no exterior e não, não pôde comparecer. É, a ideia da, da, do encontro é mais ou menos óbvia né? e, e dá sequência às atividades nossas do Instituto aqui na nossa programação de seminários e certamente do Centro também. Vamos fazer aqui um, um, um quadro, e isso ficará por conta do, do Lue, da economia internacional, mais globalmente, e caberá ao Arthur fazer um foco mais preciso uh, na situação da China. Eu vou pedir para a Júlia, em brevíssimos minutos aqui, uh, fazer uma apresentação dos nossos dois palestrantes, para que aqueles que não os conheçam tenham uma uh, ideia do que tem pela frente. Meia hora cada um, depois a gente abre para perguntas aqui como de hábito. Muito obrigado. Bom, primeiro, eu gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos vocês, agradecer ao Sérgio Fausto pela sua parceria com o Instituto Fernando Henrique, e dizer que o Arthur Krobra é um grande amigo do Conselho desde o início, é um, um grande especialista em China, a gente acompanha o trabalho dele há, há muitos anos, que faz o Dragonomics, e o Louis Gave eu estou conhecendo hoje, e é da Gave Call, então o Louis Gave vai falar hoje um pouco é, sobre a visão é, global durante mais ou menos meia hora, e o Arthur vai focar então no tema de China. E depois a gente vai abrir para o debate, todo mundo... É, vai poder fazer as perguntas, a palestra vai ser feita em inglês e eu espero que vocês aproveitem. Obrigada. Muito bem. Uh, so, Gabe, you have 30 minutes, right? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think both Arthur and I are very honored uh, to be here and uh, delighted to be talking about a topic that's close to our hearts, uh, China. Arthur has spent uh, 16 out of the past 20 years in China. I've spent uh, 12 out of the past 15 years either living on the mainland or living in Hong Kong. Um, and we're very much looking forward to uh, the interactive part uh, of this conversation. Um, but before we get there, I thought that indeed for maybe 20, 25 minutes, I could review some of the investment themes that we hold dear to our heart. Uh, and then, of course, Arthur will, will speak about China. Um, and once again, I want to, uh, to thank the Cardoso Institute uh, for hosting us here. I want to thank Julia and Sergio for, for organizing this. Uh, and we are really, really delighted to be here. Um, the presentation I'm going to go through is a presentation that, oh, thank you, is a presentation that I basically wrote uh, at the end of last year, having gone around and seen many of our clients around the world. Now, Arthur and I are very lucky because we have clients in a wide range of businesses, people who work in commodities and bonds and equities. And what struck us at the end of last year was how miserable everybody felt. Everywhere, everywhere we went, people were grumpy, and people everywhere we went were telling us, we've never worked so hard for so little money. Um, and we started to wonder, okay, how come we're getting the message, the same message, regardless of the region and regardless of the business that people are in? And then it struck us that actually what was probably happening is that the trends that had been in place for 10 years, very deep structural trends that had been reshaping our global economy were in the process of shifting. And we were starting to see new trends, but these new trends were potentially hard for investors to identify, especially investors that had been successful for the previous 10 years, uh, really riding the, the previous 10 years trends. And what were these trends? Well. I hate, I hate to start my speech by quoting a mass murderer, but back in the days of the Rev Russian Revolution, Lenin said, there are decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks when decades happen. And I think if you look back to exactly, or more or less exactly 10 years ago, we did have a period of three or four months where massive events did unfold, events that would end up having a repercussion for 10 years. And these events were threefold. You had 9-11. Now, we all remember it. Highly traumatic event. 
two months later, you had China signing the WTO. At the time, few people paid attention. Third event, six weeks after that, you had the introduction of the euro. And again, these three events would unleash forces that would have profound effect for the next 10 years. Now with 9-11, what you saw in the US was the start of 10 years of what you could call guns and butter policies. Basically, the US decided, we're going to fight two land wars in Asia. We're going to build houses for anyone who wants a house, even if they can't afford it. We're going to spend more money on health care and education than we've ever spent, but we're not going to pay for any of it. We're, not, we're going to cut our taxes, and we're just going to increase the weight of government. Now, this chart is a very simple chart. The gray line here is the weight of government as a percentage of GDP, and you read it on the left-hand scale. So when the line goes down, and it's inverted, so when the line goes down, it means government is getting bigger. The red line is the structural growth rate of GDP. So basically, this shows that the bigger the government gets in the US, the lower the structural growth rate. And the lower the structural growth rate, you get a consequent derating of assets. So US equities do nothing for 10 years, and the US dollar derates for 10 years. This was the story of the past 10 years of the US. Big expansion in government, weaker growth, weaker asset prices for the US. The story for China was a more exciting one. China signs the WTO and in essence becomes the factory floor for the world. And in the space of 10 years, China moves from being an also ran to all of a sudden being the single largest exporter in the world. From $250 billion in exports to 1.6 trillion in just a decade. And China, with all this uh, foreign trade earnings, doesn't just sit and spend the money. What China does is it goes on an infrastructure spending boom such as the world has never seen. And you see capital spending move from 30% of GDP to 45% of GDP. And basically, in the space of 10 years, China puts in as much ca uh, infrastructure as it took 30 years in Europe to build, in terms of roads, airports, etc. And of course, as it does that, it moves it to being the first consumer of commodities around the world. China, basically, by 2008, you pick any commodity, China's usually take, taking 30 to 50% of the global market in it. And this has massive repercussions for countries everywhere. As a friend of mine put it to me in 2006, a friend who manages the biggest African equity fund, China's growth was doing more for uh, African infrastructure than 50 years of Western aid in terms of building roads, in terms of uh, ports, railways, etc. And of course, you're very familiar with this in Brazil, because over the course of that decade, Chinese uh, uh, Brazilian exports to China from moved from being two percent to twenty percent of of your total exports. The third key trend of the past decade was the introduction of the euro. And with the introduction of the euro, you basically saw Northern Europe subsidize consumption in Southern Europe for an entire decade, really without realizing it. For 10 years, Southern Europe ran bigger and bigger budget deficits, when bigger and bigger trade deficits, and Northern European banks just kept buying up the paper because for all they knew, it was the same paper. Until a couple years ago, they woke up and said, hold on, how much of this paper can we really own? And so, which brings you, of course, to the current situation. These three trends, expansion of government balance sheet in the US, Northern Europe subsidizing consumption in Southern Europe. China going through a massive infrastructure spending boom. They more or less started at the same time. And oddly enough, for different reasons, they're more or less ending at the same time. Now, I could sit here and talk for two hours about the European crisis, but I'm not going to. So please don't run away. Um, I think everybody is well versed in the European crisis. We read about it every day in the paper. I think everybody has their opinion. So if it's okay with you, I'll just say that what's obvious is that Northern Europe isn't going to subsidize consumption in Southern Europe anymore, and I'll just move on from there. Um, I'm French myself, so I can get quite emotional talking about the European crisis, so I'll, I'll just as well avoid it. Um, I will talk for two seconds about the important change that's going on in the US, because here I think there's a massive misperception in the market, and you saw it against, again last Friday. Last Friday, you had the US GDP numbers. 
And every economist said, oh no, once again, growth in the U.S. is below 3%. This is disappointing. The U.S. can't seem to get its, its groove back on. They're missing the important point. And the important point is that when you break down the U.S. GDP, what you find is a private sector that for the past few quarters has been growing by 3.5% or more, and a public sector that for the past few quarters has been growing between 0 and minus 0 0.2, which is exactly what the doctor ordered. It's exactly what you should want out of the U.S. Because what you have in the U.S. is a bloated government sector. And the way you remedy that is for the next 10, 15 quarters, for the government to not grow, to stay flat, and the private sector to grow 35 3.8%. And yes, this will give you GDP growth that on the surface appears disappointing at 25 2.6%, 2.8%. But fundamentally, it is very, very bullish for the U.S. economy. So here are simple charts. If you look at this gray line, this is real government spending growth in the U.S. And what you see is that for the first time in 40 years, that growth is now negative. And of course, this drags your GDP growth number, but this is a good sign. It's much better that we have this than we, if we had, let's say, private sector expanding by 1.5% and government sp expanding by 2%. We've been having that for the past few years, and that, at the end of the day, drives you into the wall. Or well, here's another way you should look at the U.S. You have two bloated sectors in the U.S., housing and government. And these two sectors need to shrink for the next five years. So what you can do is take the U.S. GDP, and take those two sectors out. This is what we do here with the gray line. This is the real, G the normal GDP number as it is published. And what you find is if you take the sh sectors that are sh the bloated sectors that need to deleverage out, what you find is actually job growth in the U.S. isn't bad at all, and more importantly, private sector GDP continues to expand. And again, this is fundamentally good news. Now, I'm not going to talk about the slowdown in Chinese infrastructure spending because that's, that, that's my colleague's Arthur uh, topic of his speech, and I don't want to steal his thunder. But instead, I'll just make my preliminary point, which is that the three key investment trends of the past decades are now rolling over. Now, it's pretty easy to look backwards and say, okay, these are the investment trends for the past decade. Looking forward and saying, these are the investment trends for the next decade is far more touch and go. Um, so here's a shot for what it's worth. Uh, and here I have a lot less certainty. But I would say this. Sitting as we do in Asia, there's a few trends that to me are very, very important. And the first trend is the possibility that over the next five to ten years, every job out there that does not require creative thinking, wherever it may be in the world, is going to get replaced by a machine, or is going to be a robot, or a piece of software. Um, and this for a very simple reason. The price of robotics has collapsed in the past two to three years. Absolutely collapsed. Let me give you, just go through a few examples to illustrate what I mean. But in terms of big, big picture, think about what happened to technology in the mid to late 90s. Indeed, if you go back to the early 80s, the head of IBM was saying the idea that homes will have individual PCs is stupid. It'll never happen. Because, of course, at the time, a PC was more expensive than a car. Fast forward 15 years, and a PC was worth $2,000. And by that point, of course, we all had to buy PCs for our children, buy PCs for our, everybody in our offices, um, and the world had to go through a massive capital spending boom in technology. Fast forward to today, and exactly the same thing is happening in robotics. So you look, for example, at General Motors. In the early 90s, for General Motors to replace a worker with a robot, the robot break-even point was at $70 an hour. So General Motors did a little bit, and then globalization kicked into gear, and robotics was pushed to the side. Fast forward to today, 20 years later, and the break-even cost is $2 an hour. Which is why even in China, low-level low manufacturing jobs are now starting to be replaced by machinery. So I'll give you a quick example. Coca-Cola has a bottling plant outside of Guangzhou from which they service the southern third of China. 
That bottling plant recently moved from 5,000 workers to 40 workers. Well, I'll give you an even better example, even mind, better mind-blowing example. Panasonic recently opened a plant outside of Osaka about a year ago. Massive plant. goes on for acres and acres. And this plant produces, aims, well, it's, it's going to be soon producing 10% of the world's 42-inch flat, 42 inch flat screen TVs. 42 inch is the model that's the most sold. It's the model that you'll have in your hotel room, etc. Think in your head how many workers. The answer is 15. 15 workers. We are moving to a world where all the TVs in the world are going to be produced by 5,000 guys. Where all the cars are going to be produced by 50 or 100,000 guys. And it of course changes a number of things. And this is going to happen over the next 5 to 10 years. Um, there's a terrific book on this, if you want to read further, called The Lights in the Tunnel by Martin Ford. But it changes a lot of things, including, of course, the model of development for a lot of countries. Indeed, if you're a poor country, if you're Vietnam or Bangladesh, the model of development has been to go to a co company like Panasonic and say, come put your factory here, I've got cheap labor. Today, Panasonic responds, yeah, what I need is 15 high-end engineers, good access to energy, and good logistics so that I can get the product out to, uh, to the uh, end consumer. Which means that one of the trends we may very well see in the next five to 10 years is the reindustrialization of the Western world, of the US, of Europe, of Japan, after all the, sh after all the deindustrialization of recent years. But this reindustrialization is not going to happen with jobs. Not with, at least not with manufacturing jobs. Instead, and this is, I think, an important question for every one of us in this room, here's another consequence. We live in a world that is still very much US dollar denominated. So if you look at uh, trade between China and Brazil, 85% of that trade takes place in US dollars. Or the trade between Korea and Indonesia, 85% of that trade takes place in US dollars. Which means that if we think that over the next 10 years, trade between Brazil and China is going to grow, and logically it should, it would be in the interest of both countries for that trade to continue growing, then you need the US trade deficit to almost get bigger every year so that the companies can get the working capital and dollars to finance that trade. So let's look at this US trade deficit for a second. This is it here, the gray line. The U.S. today exports about $500 billion a year. And this provides the working capital for global trade. Now, if you break down that $500 billion, you find out that about half is energy. So the U.S. exports $250 billion to buy energy. And it exports $250 billion to buy manufactured goods. But then what happens if over the next five or 10 years, the manufacturing moves back to the U.S.? Panasonic decides, I don't need to have the plant in China or in Japan, I'll put it in Rochester, New York. Then the trade, US trade balance continues to improve while simultaneously, for the reason we described before, the US budget deficit is also improving. Now let's go one step further. The other 250 billion the US exports is for energy. Now how certain are we that the US over the next 10 years is gonna continue exporting $250 billion a year for energy? Personally, I'm not certain at all. Because if you look at the past year or two, the U.S. has found a lot, a lot of energy at home. Now, granted, a lot of this energy is in oil. A lot of this energy is natural gas. So it will take some retooling of the U.S. Uh, electricity grid and retooling of the U.S. energy infrastructure for them to use this gas optimally. But, you know, crazier things have happened. Maybe one day the U.S. can develop an energy policy. Uh, you know, one lives in hope. But all this to say that when you look at the U.S. trade balance, for the past 15 years, it's pretty much steadily deteriorated. For the next 10 years, the odds are it steadily improves, meaning the U.S. exports fewer and fewer dollars. Now, the reason this matters, I'm trying to find a slide, sorry. The reason this matters is this, is as I said, the world to trade needs U.S. dollars. Now, this is a simple chart looking at central bank reserves held at the Fed. And what you find is when the world has too many dollars, central bank reserves grow very fast. 
When the world doesn't have enough dollars, they start shrinking. We are already in a situation where central banks' reserves are shrinking, which I think partly explains all the troubles that Europe is in. Looking forward for the next few years, this situation, instead of improving, could continue deteriorating. So this is a major, major shift in the investment environment. Because if we move into a world where the U.S. exports fewer and fewer dollars, then how are we going to finance world trade? Where is Brazil, China, Russia, Indonesia, um, Korea going to get the dollars to finance their trade? Well, then I think there's two options. One option is if we can't sell goods or energy to the U.S., we'll have to sell them assets. That's how we'll get dollars. But if we sell them assets, the Americans will only buy assets if these assets are much cheaper than those priced in America. And that's only going to happen, of course, if the U.S. dollar revalues massively. So that's one possibility. The, other, the second possibility, and that's another major, major important shift in trend, is the hope or possibility that maybe we start moving away from the U.S. dollar. That China and Russia, uh, China and Brazil, when they trade, start trading perhaps not in U.S. dollar, but instead start trading in renminbi. Now, this is, of course, what China is now trying to promote. China is now going around not only its neighbors in Asia, but pretty much all the major emerging markets and saying, look, you're Korea, I'm China. We do 90% of our trade in U.S. dollars, which puts us at the dependency of U.S. banks and European banks and their willingness to finance us. Now, what we've learned in the past five years is that this is not a good situation to be in. So let's do our trade in renminbi. And I can guarantee you that my banks will always finance our trade. So Korea will say to China, yeah, that sounds good. That diversifies my business. I'm happy to trade in renminbi with you. But if I'm going to trade in renminbi with you, I need to keep renminbi as reserves. And if I'm going to keep renminbi as reserves, you need to give me assets that I can buy with these renminbi. So China at the beginning of this year says, okay, I've heard you and I understand and I'm creating the offshore RMB bond market in Hong Kong. And so at the, since the beginning of this year, it's been possible for foreign investors, you, me, everybody in this room, to go out and buy RMB bonds. And what China did is to get this market going, it started issuing government bonds in Hong Kong. And the next step is it's basically twisting the arm of every multinational that wants to do business in China and telling them, go issue a bond in Hong Kong in RMB. So in the past year, you've seen Unilever, Volkswagen, Ford, BP, Tesco, Air Liquide, Caterpillar, you name it, issue bonds in Hong Kong. And this is, for me, a major, major development. I think if you look back, sorry, if you look back at the past 30 years, what you find is that the single most important financial event was potentially the creation by Michael Milken in the early 80s of the junk bond market. This revolutionized finance. It led to a wave of M&A. It led to a change in the way companies finance their growth. It led to a change, frankly, in the way banks were run. It led to the emergence of private equity. Um, it completely revolutionized finance. Of course, at the time, in the early 80s, you would have needed to be a big visionary to see all these changes unfolding with the creation of the junk bond market. Well, today, we're seeing the creation of the RMB bond market. And while I can't sit here and tell you I know what all the consequences can be, I think the, what I can tell you is the consequences are going to be massive. I think it's going to change the way companies in Asia finance themselves. It's going to change the way countries trade with one another and the currencies that they trade in and hereby change the volatility of that trade. Um, and I think, I think deep down it's going to have massive potential positive implications for Asia and for emerging markets. Because we should make no mistake about it. Today, within the global emerging market sphere, the heart, the center of it all, remains China. And if China, as now seems likely, is keen to move more of its trade in renminbi, I think it has the means to do so. And we as investors, as economists, as policymakers, need to think as to the potential implications um, of all this. And again, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I do uh, know the implications, but I think we should be paying a lot more attention to it. And what strikes me as very odd, like probably every one of you in this room, 
I spent a lot of time reading various economists and reading the press. And everything I read is day in, day out about the European crisis. That's all people want to write about. But the European crisis is the tail end of a trend that started 10 years ago. It's a trend that's finishing. There's no money to be made there. There's no important changes happening there. Forget it. By this point, it's priced into the market. By this point, you've got to look beyond that. And if you look, I think when we'll look back 20 years from now and say, what was the major financial event of 2011? I don't think it'll be Greece you know, hitting the wall or whatever. The major financial event of 2011, just like the major financial event of 2001 was not Argentina hitting the wall, the major financial event of 2011 was the creation, for me, we'll go back and we'll say it was the creation of the RMB bond market. So in conclusion, and before I pass on to my colleague Arthur to discuss more precisely what's happening in China, in conclusion I would say this. Again, the three key investment trends of the past decade have come to an end. And we have to look for new trends. For me, the new trends is the rise of robotics, the rise of automation, and the potential consequences it will have socially within our countries, internationally in terms of method of developments. Um, the consequences it will have on currencies, like the U.S. dollar. I think there's some very important structural trends going on in the U.S. in terms of government retrenchment, in terms of moves towards energy independence, in terms of um, move towards manufacturing moving back towards the U.S., all of which to me point towards a higher U.S. dollar. Um, and then finally, when I look at China, I think while everybody is focusing on you know, whether the growth over the next year is going to be 7.5 or 8.5, which is a completely, in my mind, meaningless debate, the important question instead is where is China financial liberalization heading and what does it mean for the world? And on this note, I'll pass on to, uh, to Arthur. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louis. Um, now the floor is yours, Arthur. Where is he? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I would like to uh, second Louis' thanks uh, both to the uh, uh, Cardoso Institute and to the uh, uh, China-Brazil Business Council. Um, Dragonomics has had a very, uh, uh, very cooperative relationship with the CBBC uh, for basically the whole time that the CBCC has been in existence. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here again to, uh, to share some views with you about um, what's going on in China and what the implications are th of that are for the rest of the world. Um, and uh, I mean, I think Louis has, has touched on uh, the major themes that I want to address, which is what are the implications of the, the next stage of China's growth? Uh, in the next stage of China's growth is, is definitely going to be a slower growth period than we're, than we're used to. And then the second question is uh, financial liberalization is, is clearly a key issue for China uh, as it enters this new stage of its development. And how is that going to be handled domestically and what implications will that have for the rest of the world? So what I basically want to suggest to you today is that um, even for a country like Brazil that uh, is very relies very significantly on a high rate of Chinese growth, uh, we really should not be concerned too much about um, a, a reduction in the Chinese growth rate because fundamentally what's happening in China is that it is moving from being a, a very, very high growth economy to being a very large economy. And when you are a very large economy, uh, even a slower growth rate can have a dramatic impact. And I'm going to show you just how dramatic that is. But let, let me first put out some general figures that, that suggest um, you know, where we're headed. Uh, 
between 2003 and 2010, so this is the period of the, the China boom that we're familiar with, uh, the Chinese economy grew at about 11% a year in real terms on average. And we think that growth rate clearly is unsustainable. And over the next eight years, we would anticipate uh, China being able to maintain a growth rate of about 7.5% a year. So one way of thinking of this is that China's growth rate is going to decelerate by one-third. That, that's a fairly significant slowdown. Um, and I should interject at this point, we've spent at Dragonomics uh, much of the last year examining in great detail some of the arguments put forward by uh, pessimists and negative commentators who suggest that China is a bubble, uh, that the growth rate is going to slow much le to a much lower level, uh, that there's going to be some kind of a crash. We've looked at all of the arguments um, for this, this point of view, and we don't find significant support for any of them, frankly. Um, if you look at um, uh, China's total capital stock uh, relative to the size of its population, if you look at the percentage of population uh, working in, still working in traditional agriculture, uh, if you look at per capita incomes, uh, if you look at basically any indicator of China, um, of the Chinese economy, China looks an awful lot like Japan in the late 1960s. Um, and Japan in the late 1960s had another 15 to 20 years of pretty high speed uh, growth ahead of it. So we're quite confident that since the Chinese model is, is quite similar to the model employed by Japan, Korea, Taiwan, the other successful uh, East Asian economies, um, that um, essentially the, the Chinese economy probably has another somewhere between 10 and 20 years of pretty high speed growth ahead of it. Uh, and uh, the question is, how fast is high speed? And what we think over the next decade or so is 7 to 7.5% 7 is, is probably uh, what is uh, plausible. Um, so is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? Well, um, you could say, well, this is a big slowdown, so this is going to be a bad thing. Um, but what this does is it ignores the base effect. And, and it's a very simple calculation. Think of it this way. Ten years ago, China was a one trillion U.S. dollar economy. So if it increased its domestic demand by 10 percent, that added a hundred billion dollars to the world economy. Today, it's a seven trillion dollar economy. So if it increases its domestic demand by seven percent, that adds 500 billion dollars to the world economy. So in other words, 7% growth today is five times more important than 10% growth 10 years ago. Um, and that's basically where we are with China today. The growth rate, which is what we've paid attention to for so long, basically doesn't matter.